Maxine Burkett is a public policy fellow with the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. She's also a law professor at uh, the University of Hawaii. That's Welcome right. and thanks for joining us, Maxine. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Here to discuss the impact of climate change on migration. That's right. I guess what the, this climate-induced migration I hear, uh, climate displacement. Sure. What do we call it? What is the terminology? That's a great question. That's one of the, the questions that we're grappling with right now. There, the reason why we're grappling with it is because oftentimes you hear it referred to as climate refugees. Mm -hmm. and and because refugee as a term has a very specific meaning in legal the law, it's a very specific legal definition with, yes, follow on protections for those that are designated as refugees. Because of that, it's really difficult to identify if this group would be considered climate refugees. And in fact, most scenarios are situations in which you would not be able to call them refugees according to the legal definition. Uh, uh, tell, tell us where this is happening mostly. Sure. And, and what the scale of it is. Well, so that's part of what makes this such a fascinating topic, right? It's, it's, it's unclear exactly where all of this is happening, although we know that there are pockets of it throughout the world that's happening right now. We see it in our country, this displacement that's happening or, and planned relocation that's happening, both in the Arctic region as well as in the Louisiana Delta regions. Mm -hmm. We see it globally happening, certainly across uh, borders, primarily within borders. So internal displacement's a major issue, as it is more so here in the United States. Um, and then we also see it obviously in the Pacific Islands. And the Pacific Islands get a lot of attention for a good reason, uh, for two reasons. One is that a number of them, especially the Atoll Nations, are risking entire questions about inhabitability of their territory, but also because these are the populations that are the least responsible for climate change in terms of emissions. The, the 1% or less of so the world's emissions. Negligible. I and mean, if you put all of the small islands together, you're looking at that kind of percentage, but some most register at a non-negligible uh, Unfortunately, how things level. often work that way. It is, the, right. The unintended right. consequences. The, um, I want, to, I want to ask you about uh, the types of things. I mean, sea level rising is an obvious one, right. but it's not the only one, correct? What are there other it's, aspects of climate change that are having this impact on people's lives? Yeah, it's not the only one. Um, we're, you also want to look at desertification, drought. You're looking at storm inundation, the things that make your fresh water resources or, or your ability to grow food in some so way challenged. So a more acidic ocean that changes the uh, fishing locally could yes, mean fishermen that's, have to move. That's part of it. Acidification is sort of the evil twin of climate change. It's of a different phenomenon, but very much related to our carbon emissions. That's going to introduce new stresses that we're still waiting to see bear out. But part of the reason sea level rise is so significant is because it's, it's sort of connection to climate change, our emissions, historically is linear in the same way that heat and extreme heat, which will also be an issue, mm -hmm. is becoming more of a concern. If you look at a country like Bangladesh, you're seeing more information about its vulnerability with respect to drought. And of course, it being so low-lying, sea level rise has been an initial concern, and it still is and will continue to be, but as is heat, drought, and all of these other extreme events that we're seeing triggered by so climate change. So wildfires in the American West could be part of this as well? Wildfires could be part of it. I mean, there are, uh, there's certainly relocation that's happening as a result of that and acute displacements when there are these events. Absolutely. When that happens, people have to move. And it could be a very, uh, again, acute, sudden, sort of sudden onset type of, of relocation or displacement or it can be sort of a slower onset. So rising sea levels, you're sort of, you're seeing flooding happening more uh, sort of detrimentally to your infrastructure, um, the built environment, et cetera. These kinds of slower creeps, desertification, drought, they tend to also sort of have some relationship to why communities move. We're just trying to capture how we can predict that. Uh, another buzzword that comes up is adaptation. That's and right. people on these, in these island nations are in the front lines of adaptation mm -hmm. and uh, are leading the way in many ways. Sure. Uh, is there good news to share in that regard? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. There are, and, and it's particularly with respect to island nations, we're looking at communities that are being very clever from, from technology to using financial resources to better equip themselves to be more resilient in the face of, of the impacts. If you look at the Caribbean, for example, we, there's a use of insurance that's very uh, innovative. It's looking at risk. It's looking at how to pool risk so that you can dispatch funding much more readily and rapidly after an event happens. And these kinds of regional arrangements are also quite effective. You have the sort of redundancy that you need, the additional capacity, additional resources and collaboration that makes all communities and ecosystems more resilient. Is the type of adaptation activity that we're seeing, 
Is this more buying time or is it a long-term solution? Well, well, I mean, it's uh, it's I, it's it's both in some ways. I wouldn't call it buying time in the sense that it, it doesn't sound as much a, a, of an investment in your in your future in the way that the long-term adaptation resilience hopes to do. I mean, we hope to be able to adapt and accommodate certain elements of the new changes that we're seeing. But because those changes are going to be constantly changing, that's the nature of climate change. There is an attempt to uh, be in relationship with it, to invest in the appropriate spaces to not invest in the areas that make you more vulnerable to the impacts mm -hmm. of climate change. This is important. I want to take the time, though, to, to sort of say, or at least one moment to say, that um, we don't want, and you find that a number of small island nations will not sort of allow for there to be migration as an option per se. And that would be more along the buying time sort of, of discussion. A number of these countries are saying, look, we don't want this to be on the table. We want the emissions that's causing this to be rapidly reduced so that we can can continue to live in uh, our ancestral home. And that's also a key message. What, uh, I know I'm easing into this question because I don't want to sound alarmist about it, sure. but I'm sort of wondering at, at what point does adaptation is no, no longer an option? Sure. Well, we, we are finding that that's happening now to some degree. If you look at some of the studies that have been done, case studies throughout the global south in particular, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, if you look at parts of the Pacific, there are communities that are doing traditional adaptation measures, whether it's seawalls or some other sort of soft armoring, for example, when it comes to coastal issues. Uh, those things are failing. So we, a number of, of communities are still finding significant damage, even if they have attempted to adapt to what's forecast. So we're looking at this era of, of sort of beyond adaptation, of loss and damage, of the kinds of actions that will look at things that are not able to be replaced or repaired, and how do we either prepare for that, insure against it, etc. Maxine, I don't know if this is a fair question, but I'm sort of wondering if you would think of it in terms of the rate of burn or the rate of uh, increase of the problem versus the rate of activity yes. in trying to create solutions, right. is there a big gap? Massive. <laughs> I would say it's a pretty significant yeah. uh, gap. And I, again, I too want to be careful here. We don't want to sound alarmist about it. Right. We want to be very sort of measured in our uh, understanding of, or at least our communication of what we understand and what we know. This is profoundly a, a circumstance of uncertainty, not that there's no risk. In fact, the risk may be far greater than we are even forecasting now. And some of those forecasts are, are quite dire. But this is a situation in which we need to feel comfortable with addressing the uncertainty and, again, building in the kinds of, of mechanisms that allow us to be more resilient no matter what, what comes. But yes, there is a significant gap between what we understand to be the change that we are uh, facing and our sort of efforts in facing them, whether it's the political will, whether it's the capacity and resources, um, whether it's shared responsibility. These things still need to to be um, influenced positively moving forward. So about those about those trend lines, sure. what, what, do we have any sort of sense based on our best estimates now of when the type of migration we're talking about here becomes as much of an issue as sort of the migration caused in Europe because of the conflict in Syria or when Manhattan is talking about extraordinary measures so that lower Manhattan is not Atlantis. You know, how far away are we from those types of occurrences? Well, so um, this is the, again, the sort of question of, of, of timing. Um, it's really difficult to forecast exactly, and I don't, I don't want to sort of pin down a specific number or year. A number of researchers will look to 2050 and sort of make a guesstimation based on that because it's, you know, half, the halfway point, 2050. Yes. So, and we can use these kind of benchmarks, whether it's 2025 and obviously 2100. But the, the notion here is that, um, you know, we may never sort of, capture a specific number, we have to follow the trends. And the slow onset events are easier to capture in the sense that you can at least sort of see over the long term which areas will be primarily stressed, whether it's because of sea level rise or increasing drought and desertification or extreme heat, again, which will be a major issue for many, many uh, cities and, and uh, wider communities. But there are sudden events. And those sudden events may be more, may have been more likely because of the changes in climate um, and because of the increases in temperature. So so those sudden events may introduce the kinds of influxes that we we can't anticipate um, significantly or sufficiently. And then, and then in terms of uh, legal trend lines in, yeah. in uh, international law, sure. will we see a time soon where uh, people displaced by climate change are treated the way people who are displaced by war or political upheaval are treated? 
I'm not. I'm not sure what whether or not we will see that rapidly. What I do know is that we're at a point where we're looking at the current state of the law. I think there is a recognition that it's inadequate as it is. There's no one instrument or legal policy or document or even a s section or statement that will answer that question. Mm -hmm. But we do know that uh, there's a lot of creativity in the patchwork. If we pull together a number of the, the laws that we have now, perhaps we can have a protection mechanism that's that's held by that sort of interweaving that net of. Of, of disparate laws. But do we need a better, more coherent infrastructure? I think so. Now, I want to remind you that the internal displacement is a bigger issue. So domestic laws will matter more in some respects than international laws in terms of the numbers of people it'll impact. So what the U.S. does with respect to internal relocation and displacement uh, will be very significant, but certainly in the global south as well. Are there countries leading the way in that regard? Uh, well, there are, uh, in, in some respects, we are sort of still waiting to see how well that's that's working. Some countries are creating policies internally. Um, we know that there are a number of principles that are being devised and sort of uh, reconsidered to apply to the circumstance of internally displaced peoples and how we can ensure rights. We also are seeing a more, I think, effective arguments for the international community supporting those in-country efforts to the extent that they can while recognizing sovereignty and respecting sovereignty, but also recognizing that this is climate change itself is a product of, of sort of international action and our actions need to reflect that in terms of how we support countries that are struggling. A final thought, you mentioned earlier uh, political will. Sure. And so my, my thought is about where are you looking to for leadership or the most vibrant discussions around these issues where we might see uh, some trendsetters or some people take the lead? Yeah, I mean, uh, or nations. I, no, it's not an individual necessarily. Yeah, no. Well, and in some in some respects, a number of the the nations themselves are we're looking at leaders that are thinking uh, thinking uh, sort of in very big, uh, creative ways that are creating relationships across the aisles. Um, this is a good question. I think that there's a, a lot of um, momentum and enthusiasm after the Paris meetings. I think the island nations were uh, really the vanguard. There were leaders like Tony de Bruyne who were looking at ways to collaborate and create uh, relationships that were were long-standing and that were about the sort of human costs of climate change much more than the geopolitics of it or concerns about the, just simply the the, um, the the very restricted notions of what e the economic impact would look like. So we're looking at leaders like like the Tony de Brooms and small island folks that are at the at the helm and are really demanding that we're more aggressive in our approaches to to climate change and not leave their communities at the front lines all by themselves. Well, well thank you for joining us and thank thanks you. for your leadership in this area. Thank you. And a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you too.